Hey, everybody, welcome back to another fantastic edition of the His and Her Money Show, where we make it our business to help you take dominion over your money and your life. We're so glad to have you here rocking with us for yet another episode because you could be somewhere else. But the fact that you're here with us, we want you to know that we are grateful. We are excited about today's episode because we have one of our heroes waiting in the wings to share some knowledge um, with us. He's been here before and he's here again. And we are grateful because he is a profound thinker. He's a leader of leaders and his wisdom is immeasurable. Uh, I've been blessed to read a ton of his books over the years. As a matter of fact, fun fact, 2001, I came to faith in Jesus because of a book that our guest wrote um, called Maximize the Moment. And I'm talking about none other than Bishop T.D. Jakes. And he's here to talk about a brand new book and some some new work that he's uh, been up to as of late. And he's going to help us all learn from it, apply it to our lives so that we can be all that we were sent to this earth to become. So get your pen and paper ready. Come on, it's Bishop. You know you're going to have to take notes. Get your get your iPad, notes app open. Do what you got to do to be prepared to write down all the gems that are about to come your way. Let's go get Bishop T.D. Jakes so we can hear all of his great wisdom that he has for us today. Hey, Bishop, welcome back to the His and Her Money Show. It is a real pleasure to be back with you. How are you doing today? Doing absolutely fantastic. We're so grateful to have you back with us. It's been a little bit. You were here last time to talk about one of your books called Don't Drop the Mic that just set the world on fire and really challenged us in many ways. And now you're back because you've written a brand new fantastic book called Disruptive Thinking. And we are excited to learn even more from you on today. Bishop, I don't know if there might be literally two people in the audience who don't know who you are. So for them, <laughs> could you say hello to them and kind of let them know what you've been up to lately? What's on your heart? Well, hello, everybody. I'm delighted and excited to be here. It's uh, another great day, a great opportunity for all of us to learn, to grow, and to evolve. And that's why I face every day with the intent of expansion and being the best version of myself, which can be challenging, <laughs> but uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, I am currently have just written uh, a book called Disruptive Thinking. And I, 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 you know, you write you write as you grow. You can only give what you know. And as I look over the terrain of where we are right now, it seemed incumbent upon me to say something about changing the way we think, because I realized that normal is not coming back. We went through two, almost three years of utter chaos with COVID, and it changed the world. It changed everything. It changed the socioeconomic levels of life. It changed the way we work and if we work and whether we work from home and how we work and changed businesses went out. Some came in, new ones replaced them, banks went down. The stock market's fluctuating, inflation's going on. It's a crazy time. It's a disruptive time. And you can't face a disruptive time with traditional thought. So disruptive thinking says in the midst of calamities, there are always opportunities. Uh, are you willing to leap after one of them? And if you do leap after one of them, and disrupt your old way of doing things and I'm prepared to be, embrace a new world with artificial intelligence and technology booming and traditional jobs going away. If you're, if you're ready to embrace a deeper understanding of where we are rather than to continue to pitch tantrums about where we're not, then go on this ride with me because uh, disruptive thinking is designed for people who want the second half of their life to look better than the first, whatever better is to you, and how to get there and what it takes to stand there, even when people want to push you away. Now, you just talked about kind of a cataclysmic situation that we just came out of, yet uh, you start this book saying that the reason for writing this book at this time is because our society seems to be headed for a cataclysmic collision of 
biblical proportion. Now, Bishop, I've been reading, listening, watching you for a long time, and I know you don't mix words. I know every word that you use, you use with intentionality. So that sounds pretty bad, pretty bleak. What brought you to this conclusion to make such a bold statement? It is the perfect storm between the fluctuations of the market, uh, the uncertainty of the times, the inflation that we're living up under, uh, the starting of BRICS oh, globally, moving away from the dollar as currency. It is the time where we're trying to rebound. When the world gets a cold, we get the flu. So while it is tough for everybody in general, underserved communities get it tougher. So tough that we have gotten used to tough and we call tough normal. <clears throat> when you normalize tough, then you don't leave it. As long as you accept it, it will stay as a guest in your house. Whether tough is emotional toughness, a mental toughness, a financial toughness, family toughness, as long as you accept it as normal, it will become your roommate. Disruptive thinking says the thinking that brought you here will not take you there. And there for me and for people of color is by 2050, the median income is projected to be at zero. Technology's taking our jobs. We, we're not financially literate. We're, we have not prepared ourselves for this shift in the world, paradigm shift. This is not done to us. It's, it's just the perfect storm of all the things I listed before. And if we don't disrupt the way we think, get out of our feelings, get down to the facts, and start shifting with the times which was hastened by COVID, okay, which was hastened by COVID. We were going toward tech in a rapid pace anyway, but now COVID has hastened it. We're going to lose our middle class. And if we fall, that many people fall beneath the poverty line that the median income is at zero. That means even though there are other people who lived above it and did well, we're going to have the haves and the have-nots, which is going to increase crime, which is going to increase disruption. I cover everything from entrepreneurship to partnerships in business, to aligning yourself with smart people, to preparing yourself for new adventures. I've started a real estate uh, development community development corporation that's developing neighborhoods, putting in uh, stores, putting in retail, mixed income, uh, so that repressed neighborhoods can get up on their feet. I'm excited about it. I'm, I'm delighted about it in my senior years. It's my legacy piece. It's the way I want to give something back to the years and years and years of people that have supported me, undergirded me, helped me to be who I am. I want to do the same in return and, and was doing it and have been doing it. And now I'm able to accelerate it uh, through partnerships like uh, what we just did with Wells Fargo. It's, it's pulling capital, needed capital, to the community. Doesn't matter whether you like the mailman. I'm after the mail. <laughs> okay. So we, we, we digress from opening the envelope to fighting about the mailman. It's a billion dollars coming into our community to help develop us economically so that we can build our businesses, so that we can grow our economy, and so that we can live in nice surroundings. So either you run off the front porch and bite the mailman, or you get the mail. And that's the truth of it. But our propensity is to say, if I don't like the mailman, I don't want the mail. I want the mail. Okay. Secondly, uh, we're going to use that to put in infrastructure, develop real estate, develop suppressed communities, mixed income from 16% uh, below AMI, area median income, which makes it uh, low income housing, mixed in with affordable workforce, teachers, nurses, doctors, uh, janitors, uh, people who are out there trying to make a living, barbers, police officers can live in, in that area. So you have a mixed integrated income between workforce, low, certain percentage of low, certain percentage of medium, and then a certain percentage of high end. When we have mixed income housing, the stats show 
that the people keep their neighborhoods and take care of their houses. They, they're they more likely to go to college because they live around people who did, and the standard of living just goes up. So I'll tell you anything about it. But So I'm basically on two tracks, entrepreneurship, very strongly, uh, and, and the other thing is real estate ventures. It's really three tracks because the third thing is STEM programs. We're having STEM programs for kids. We're doing pathways for job retention. Uh, we just hosted a job fair uh, at our church, but this is bigger than Dallas. I'm rolling this out nationwide and disruptive thinking is just a model for all my disruptive friends out there who are sitting on the couch thinking about doing something uh, and not getting support from your friends. Read this book for all my people out there who are sitting up there waiting on somebody to hire you at the price you're worth and they won't do it. Read this book. For all those people who are satisfied to pay the rent and pay the utilities and get high every now and then or go to church every now and then or whatever you do to to anesthetize yourself from the pain of being stuck, read this book. It is easier to cross over than you think, but it is the way you think that gives you the mobility to move into the next dimension of your life. Man, so... Just talked about this billion dollar partnership that you did with Wells Fargo. And that's just honestly, if anybody's been watching the, the arc of your career, um, you've been you've been challenging the status quo as to what a pastor can do. Um, movies, even the books. You was the first one out here just just dropping books at the rate and the pace and the quality that's kind of normalized now, but you've been doing that for a long time to the, to the gospel plays that you did back in the day. Um, it seems like this ain't nothing new to you. You've been disrupting. You've been going left when people said, no, nah, you need to go right. You're a preacher. And even in the book, like he talked about people like the, the Elon Musk of the world, the, the Abraham Lincolns of the world. But what about you just, spoke to them briefly at the end of your last point, that person sitting on the couch, people who don't get the way that they think or out the box thinking that they have all these big ideas that they can't seem to shake, but they might look at, at Bishop, they might look at you and your career and all that you've done and be like, man, I'm up here. Of course, Wells Fargo will sit down with Bishop. He's Bishop. Um, of course, Elon, but a lot of times we don't know the story from the beginning. We don't know how, all the blood, sweat, and tears that went when there was no cameras and there was no nobody looking. So speak to where that person might be right now, because I don't want them to be discouraged and think that they can't achieve. They can't disrupt at the level that you're disrupting right now, the level that Elon is disrupting right now, the level that Abraham Lincoln disrupted during during his time. I don't want them to be disqualifying themselves prematurely. How can you encourage them? First of all, uh, Disruptive thinking is requires disruptive decisions. You are no greater than your thoughts and your thoughts are, are the catalyst that makes up your decisions. Uh, in the book, I talk about we're born looking like our parents and we die looking like our decisions. So understanding that you have the power, I'm giving the power back to you, not the circumstance, not the economy, not the community, you have the power to change your circumstance. You don't like the room, paint it. You don't like the neighborhood, find another one. Even if you got to move out of the country, even if you got a median income, even if you got low budget, I'm talking about making tiny steps and big steps toward being the best you that you can be. It's like losing weight. The day you decide to lose weight, you want to lose 30 pounds that morning. <laughs> okay. And you, you're looking in the mirror waiting on it to go because you got on the treadmill that day. And then you want to look in the mirror and see if it's working. It is not going to work like that. But if you keep doing that every day, day in and day out for weeks and weeks and weeks or three days a week or whatever you're supposed to do, small changes bring about big results. And it's the same thing about anything we're stuck in. But it's not easy. It requires something called sacrifice. It requires something like delayed gratification. It requires something, most importantly, a strategy. And then structuring your life for the direction you want it to go. Let's not leave out of it the power of prayer. 
the essential of prayer, the humility of prayer, the position of prayer, the structure of prayer that says, I am not in this world by myself. I cannot do this by myself. I need your help to do this. This is my weak area. This is my bad spot. I don't handle money. I don't read well. I don't do this well. I don't do that. I don't like people. I don't like being in front of people. I'm shy. Whatever your mountain is, we can cross it. Because wherever there's a wall or a mountain or a fence or an obstacle of any kind, it's only an indication that there's something on the other side of it that's worth attaining it. And either you live in your fears or you walk through your fears. So this disruptive thinking, thinking creates disruptive doing, creates disruptive outcomes. If you want to have great outcomes, it starts with the way you think. Mindsets control assets, whether those assets are tangible, spiritual, relational, marital, personal, weight loss, bulking up, working out in the gym, or playing golf like Tiger Woods. You can't swing the club once a year and be Tiger Woods. And you can't get, do baby pets at your future and expect big results. And let me hone in on something to, 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 to crystallize the ideology. 96% of Black-owned businesses have less than two or less employees. 96, 96, which means that we don't have companies. We have a hustle that, that with inflation is making us have to hustle faster, which is making us tireder, moodier, angrier, desperate, distraught, uh, violent, frustrated, marriages exploding, all of that, because no matter how fast the ball spins, the turn spins, the hamster only has two feet, okay? So you only have two hands. So you can only get them to go, but so fast because we're afraid to hire people and because we don't have access to capital. So our CDFI, along with there are many pre-existing CDFI, so it doesn't have to be mine and it doesn't have to be me, but uh, it is a community development financial, financial institution, offers preferential rates, sometimes with less credit requirements that enables you to scale up your business, your dream, or maybe be able to assist you with home ownership or down payment. You, you can make the payments because you're paying the rent and the rent is more than the mortgage. Why should you do it? I might leave. The young people say, I might leave. I don't want to be stuck to the house. You leaving doesn't mean the house has to leave. It does mean that you can sell it and you've got an appreciating asset and you have more to leave with, or you can keep it and rent it out and create additional incomes and then buy more houses till you've got 10. And then you won't have to move because you won't have to work because you'll have income. Value starts with teaching us ownership. I'm preaching now. I'll stop. That's what you do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, ownership, ownership is a big part of what we teach here. Um, just, you know, we've been doing this for almost 10 years. We've shown people, uh, us getting out of debt, us paying off our house, us starting a business, us getting our investments up because there's nothing more powerful than ownership. But man, you just brought up a stat that I didn't even know about that 96% of those businesses that are, that are, um, African-American own two or less employees. And so, your statement was we don't a lot of times have a business, we have a hustle. I think that goes back to thinking, right? Because we spent so much time over generations trying to survive. And sometimes that looks like having multiple jobs to, to keep our families together. Um, sometimes that looks like uh, uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul. Sometimes that looks like uh, running the cable from your neighbor to, to your house, right? That that hustle starts in our thinking. And so I, I believe that what you're trying to get us to understand is sometimes um, the, disrupt, the, the disruptive thinking is us unlearning some old patterns of thinking that we've had, even that were passed down to us generationally. So that when we now, we went to college, we got the degree or we got the experience. And now here we are with our own business, not to have that same old hustle mentality in this new entrepreneurial world. So talk to us, how do we disrupt ourselves? How do we take away, even if 
on the all the other because you said disruptive thinking leads to disruptive decisions. So maybe we saw folks struggling like, nah, I'm going to own my own. I'm going to get my own business. But yet there's that pattern of that hustle mentality that's now informing our decisions that we make within our business. So how do we disrupt ourselves to rid ourselves of those types of patterns of thinking now that we're in these new spaces? Look, look at our, uh, your, your, it's a great question. Great conversation. <clears throat> but listen, look at the model you had and, and, and then look at the product you built. You're going to look like what you saw. What we saw was what we had to see. It's what our parents showed us. Hustle, 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 hustle. Work two or three jobs, sell Avon, sell toothpaste, sell CDs, black market stuff, whatever you could sell dope. We've always hustled. So now we open up a business and we're selling uh, uh, milkshakes or we're selling hot dogs or we're selling healthy foods or whatever it is. We're selling hair, black hair care products and we're hustling. We're opening up the store. We're cleaning out the garbage. We're interviewing the people. We're working the floor. We're doing everything. But if you're doing your business, you can't be thinking your business. You don't have time to get an EIN number. You don't have time to separate your personal finances from your business finances. You don't have time to get a, a, a tax attorney. You don't have the resources to back up because you, you, you won't let go of the power because your grandchildren said you made the best fried chicken in the world. You're not going to let anybody have the recipe. So you're in there frying chicken when you ought to be paying taxes. You're in there frying chicken when you ought to be hiring somebody to fry the chicken because you are paid to think, not to do. So, so, so we must understand that we are not human doings. We are human beings. And so the reason I'm on a vigilante to do this, and I've started a, a program called Good Soil. And there's an app uh, that's downloadable called the Good Soil app for entrepreneurs exclusively. I don't need prayer warriors in there. I got another app coming for you. <laughs> okay, so leave your tambourine at home. This is for people who are trying to get impact, grow, and scale their business. There's curriculum. There's teaching. There's a networking inside of it. We need to talk to each other. We are the people we've been looking for. We can't just wait on outside people to bless us. I don't care what's right about it. I don't care how long you've been angry about it. I've been angry too. I've been angry. I've cried. I, I picked it when I was younger. I've done everything. Okay. I did all of it. I did all, met with the CEOs, met with Congress, met with Senate. I've done all of it, done all of it. If we're going to get up, we're going to have to pull each other up. So, my Good Soil Movement Network is a place where uh, entrepreneurs can go and say, I got this wrong. I don't know how to do this. How do I get my paperwork? How do I get my 501c3? How do I, S corporation, C corporation? Let's help each other. Second thing that I'm doing is building neighborhoods in diverse communities, taking down large tracts of land. No, I'm not interested in buying your house. Please don't send me a picture of your house and ask me if I want to buy it. I'm not building, buying houses. I'm building communities, 80 acres, 100 acres in prominent areas where there's an economic engine, where people are working hard and the rent's going out of range and they're working hard and living poor. I'm wondering, um, because all of these are needed and necessary, but for you, when you were dialing this up, whiteboarding it out with your team, um, what made you go this path? Because there's, you know, there's so many you know, social causes that are out there in the world, but you saw this as something that can have reverberating effects. You called it your your legacy move. So between the good soil movement where you're you're focusing on uh, entrepreneurship and, and diverse communities to the part the billion dollar partnership now that you have with Wells Fargo where you're building communities for mixed income families. What are you hoping that focusing on entrepreneurship and ownership can do or, company, or excuse me, for communities that have not had exposure to this previously? If I live to get to the 2040s or the 2050s, which is very unlikely, but if I do, and my great-great-grandchildren ask me, what did you do to stop it? I want to be able to tell them I did everything I could. Uh, I am concerned about this. I think it is important. I think it's serious, and I think we, we are 
intoxicated with the fact that we can now go outside and play that we don't realize that that doesn't mean that the challenges have diminished. It just means they have changed forms. The war in, in, in the Ukraine, the, the sign of the bricks coming, the testing of the banks, the walls are closing in. And if we are not proactive and remain a reactive, regretful uh, people, we will not get up. So my job is to blow the trumpet to design, to sound the alarm, to tell you it starts not with your with a, your rich uncle dying, living you leaving you a million dollars. I can give you a million dollar thought. You're one thought away from a life changing experience. You're one meeting away. Meeting one person could change the trajectory of the rest of your life. But you got to get out of your hood and away from your friends and away from people who can't help you and connect with people who can help you. And so that when you go back to the people who couldn't help you, you brought bread with you, you brought help with you, you brought resources or at least a job. If all of us hire one person, we could make a dent. As it is now, as low as the hiring, the hiring rate is, one in every five black people work for a black person or a black owned company. That's, that's impact, bro. That's major impact. You're disrupting people's thinking right now during this interview. A lot of people are having aha moments, like really introspective, like, man, where has my thinking been? Has it been where it needs to be? Has it been as powerful and dynamic as it could be? I'm wondering, though, how did you cultivate that? I, we see the fruit right now. How did you cultivate that? Because some people, I don't want them to leave this space and then be combat it with their, just fall right back into their old pattern of thinking. How can we make daily decisions? As you talked about disruptive thinking leads to disruptive decisions. What are some daily things we can do to cultivate this and make this our new way of thinking? First thing we can do, we can separate our money. This is something everybody can do. Open up a separate account for a separate adventure. If you can't afford accounting, use the bank's use the bank deposit system to account for your money. It's just putting it all on different ledgers. Second thing we can do if we own a business is that we can pay quarterly taxes rather than annual taxes and get behind and get behind on annual taxes and get in trouble with the IRS. Quarterly taxes reduces the amount of tax you pay annually. So even if you don't pay it. Even if you don't pay it, divide it when you get gross incomes and set it in a tax account so that when Uncle Sam comes knocking, you're not running around trying to get some last minute jobs to pay your taxes. So you're running faster and faster on the treadmill. Strategize your money. Break out what your got to do's are from your want to do's. Stop doing your want to do's first and then begging for your got to do's. It's time to make a change. Pry, if you're writing notes, Write down priorities. This is, this, I haven't spent a dime. I'm talking about planning. This is how I'm going to handle the resources I have. This is the level I need to live on if I stay with this income. If I'm going to live on this level, how much money do I need to make? A budget, a structure. Bring money to mind, not emotions. I'm depressed today. I'm going to the mall. I'm depressed today. I need some shopping therapy. You know, not getting on your phone, spending an hour and a half scrolling down through Instagram lives. That's an hour of your life. You will never, ever get back again. And you spent it looking at people you don't know, saying things that you're not sure of, embracing truth that you didn't research. Get away and do something that's more productive so that when you do play, to borrow a phrase from my brothers, you earn your leisure. For sure. 100%. Now, you talk about in the book, because you just mentioned, like, don't bring your emotions to the forefront of these decisions. In the book, you talked about emotional intelligence and self-awareness as being qualities that we have to navigate and master in order to become the disruptive thinkers that we need to become. For some, what is that? What is emotional intelligence and self-awareness? How does that play a factor in doing, going on this journey? Emotional intelligence is the ability to orchestrate and manage your emotions so that they do not become a disadvantage to your decisions. 
emotional intelligence is being able to be frustrated without being violent and breaking out into a rage. Emotional intelligence is being able to apologize when you are wrong rather than internalize it and not have the words to be able to say, I am sorry. Because if you haven't heard that much in your life, you lose the ability to say those words in your life. Hearing and speaking are interconnected. If nobody says, I love you, you lose your love language. If nobody shows you how to express anger without shooting people, then when you get mad at me over a piece of bubble gum, you'll shoot me in the head. It's a learned behavior. If you learn your way in, you can learn your way out. If you learn to break up furniture because you're mad at your wife, you can learn not to do that. If you learn to walk up on your husband and slap his face and tell him you are bad, mama chama, you can learn not to do that. You can learn to enter into life from a place of respect. Listen, if we lose control of this world, what in God's name are we going to tell our children? That we just let them red line, redistrict, move us, destroy us, dilute us, turn us against each other. If we spend half the time trying to get up that we spend attacking each other, we can make a little bit of progress. I'm, I'm not asking people to do a deal with Wells Fargo or Bank of America or J.P. Morgan Chase or whoever you want to do it. I, I, that was something I never even saw coming in all of my life, the possibility to negotiate that size deal. Regardless what you think of Wells Fargo, we got a billion dollars back into our community that we wouldn't have gotten Damn. after 65. I never thought I'd do anything like that in my life. I wasn't even looking to do that. Yes, I was building community, but at my own pace, at my own speed, at my own time. To be able to scale up my business, to do it on a larger scale at this stage is a miracle. Because you know what? I will do what I tell you I will do. My church is proof of it. My life is proof of it. I'm not perfect. I'm not passing myself off as anything supernatural. But when it comes to integrity and keeping my word, if I don't deliver, there will be no door I can find to get through to get it done. Now, um, doing anything new can be hard, difficult, tough. Since the last time we've spoken to you, um, the Lord had my wife and I start a church. And it's hard. And it's easier to follow paths that are already carved out. Yes, sir. Follow patterns that are, have already been created. So even in some of the ministry things that we've been trying to do, it's, it, it, it took a whole lot of intentionality to say, it's okay if we do it differently, if we do it like this, but it wasn't easy to think differently. So since you've gone on this journey for a long time and you've been told you shouldn't do X, Y, and Z on numerous occasions, including this latest venture, how do you, when you're confronted with that, it was right in your face and there's that, you know, crossroads. Do I, do I stick with the status quo or do I have the guts to do something that's uncharted? How do we, and more often than not, have the courage and confidence to go into the wilderness of a place that's not known as opposed to seeing on, on this left side, this is known, this is what's familiar. How do we keep the confidence and the courage each time one of these obstacles pop up? Do your research, hire good lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> Real good lawyers. Uh, talk to people who operate on that level. Do a risk assessment. Can you withstand the trauma of the attack from people who really don't even know what the deal was? And and listen at the advice of people who have done what you're doing or better, not people who have never done it. Always have an opinion about it based on what they heard about it. You can't go about what you heard about it when I'm holding the contract. I'm having the agreement. I'm writing the covenants. Don't be distracted by the noise and the pestilence. Pay attention to it because they may be right. But then weigh it against what you know about the deal you're doing that they don't even know or understand how that operates. I'm talking to you not, I'm telling you not to walk in the council of the on the Bible would say the ungodly. I would say not to walk in the counsel of people who are uninformed. You can't counsel me about 
something you don't know what it is. You can say, I know who they are or who they have been, or I know who you are and who you have been. You don't know if I've changed. You don't know if I've protected myself. You don't know if I have a, a contract that embraces this or that. So we make assumptions. And what I'm saying to you is not to put your thermostat in somebody else's room. So their opinion should not be the litmus test of the decision you make. The facts should rule the decision, not popularity, unless you're an elected official and you're running for office. You, you got to decide, do I want to seek progress or do I want to seek popularity? Because generally they drive down two different streets. Okay, so if you want to make progress, most of the people that we revere today, we hated in their lifetime. Martin Luther King was one of the most controversial people that ever walked the face of the earth amongst black people, not to mention white people, J. Edgar Hoover, all the people he had to fight amongst black people. There were all kinds of churches that wouldn't allow him in their pulpit who have got him framed in the front of the house right beside Jesus. Okay, he right beside Jesus. Okay. <laughs> and and as I'm not fighting you, but I'm saying historical data proves that you are more popular post-mortem than you are in lifetime. So those of you who need a billion likes to move forward might be cannibalizing your own progress. That's what I want to say to you. Second thing I want to tell you is even avoiding all the noise of the people Big deals are hard. Progress is hard. Losing weight is hard. Being married is hard. Raising children is hard. It, it, just because it's hard doesn't mean it's wrong. It is very, very hard. Getting into real estate is hard. Stop looking for easy. It's hard. If it were easy, anybody could do it. And the final thing I'll tell you is that you don't want it given to you. Because if everything is given to you, you don't know how to run it. When we had COVID, my wife said something to me. It was so cool, so simple, but it was so cool. She said to me, uh, I said, we can order uh, through our phone and get food delivered to the house, you know, because we, at that point, we were locked in, you know. She said, no. She said, baby, if I cook it, I know what's in it. And at that time, we didn't know whether COVID was coming through bananas, apples, cereal. I was looking at everything cross-eyed, ready to spray everything down with bleach. Uh, I'm just teasing y'all. I'm telling you, spray it down with bleach. Uh, but uh, we did not know. But her wisdom and analogy that I would do, I, when I do it myself, I know what's in it. When you build it yourself, you know what's in it. When you made the hire yourself, you know what's in it. And it, your likelihood of failure diminishes. Black women are going into business more readily than any other people group, but they're not getting sustainable capital. So when we did Good Soil and we started handing out $200,000 just as an introductory to Good Soil, when we started showing them how to scale and we start bringing in companies to offer them options to access to capital, we're, we're creating a network that I'm so excited about. Because my father was an entrepreneur and all I'm doing, and my mother bought real estate all her life. And all I'm doing is, is duplicating what I grew up in on a bigger scale to be sure, but it's still the same core. Now, last question for you, Bishop, you just brought up First Lady Sarita Jakes. Some people, a lot of people listen to our show are, are in the con are context of family. So I'm curious when you had these disruptive ideas, these thoughts, even the, the early ones uh, taking Going from pastoring in West Virginia to pastoring in Texas, uh, uh, you know what? I think I, I think God's telling me to do a play. I, I think I need to start writing books. I think I need to go on TV. When you're having these disruptive thoughts and this turning into disruptive actions, how do you navigate the conversation with the spouse? Oh, that's such a good question, and nobody's ever asked me that before. That's such a great question. You have to be a married man to ask this question because introducing these ideas when you go home, depending on the personality of your wife, can be uh, make you drive around the house about 10 times thinking about how to say it. How am I going to tell her, you know, that I'm getting ready to do another crazy thing and, and load up the truck like Jack Clampett and move across the world to a part of the country I know nothing about? Uh, I am the kind of person that does stuff like that. I am the kind of person who rents a Georgia Dome and takes a risk and takes on $10 million worth of debt to see if if I can do it and and to believe that God is with me in doing it and, and go do it. I am the kind of person uh, that 
that does an unprecedented deal with one of the oldest banks in our country. I am the kind of person who buys up 400 acres of land and builds a, a, a community development before I had a real estate ventures company. I am the kind of person who bought up 10 acres next door to my house and put 40 houses on it and walked away with the profit. I am the kind of person that does that. You, I am not married to the kind of person that does that. Okay, because both of us doing that would be too much drama for the house. Okay, you want to marry somebody who's saying, you're getting ready to do what? <laughs> you know, but my wife has been really cooperative. She's been really supportive. I married somebody who is a help me and, and a help mate. And she certainly did help meet and help make me. Uh, I, able to go and do the things I did because she held the house solid and stable and she had, had my back. And then later that we're older, she's got her own company and her own business and we're kind of changing roles. She wants to start a company. I want to stay at home. So, you know, who knows how life goes, but getting your house in agreement is in extremely important because you're going to have enough things to fight outside without having to fight inside. Yeah, good stuff. Thank you so much for sharing. Let everybody know uh, what they'll find inside the pages of Disruptive Thinking, how they can pick up a copy, and also how they can connect with your good soil movement. Okay, first of all, if you're interested in Disruptive Thinking, wherever books are sold, whether you want to mail to you by Amazon or Books a Million or Barnes and Nobles, has plenty of books ready on your way home for work. You can pick up a copy right now of Barnes and Nobles and, uh, and read it. And think about it real slow because every word is pre premeditated and be prepared to take notes. I know it's old school and old fashioned, but it may help you to extract from the book what you got out of the book. Right. Go to Amazon and they'll bring it to your house. And if you read the book, drop a comment in there about reading the book and what your experiences are with it. Uh, so I want to say that to you. Good Soil is an app you can download. Please don't download it if you're not an entrepreneur or about to be one or want to be one. Don't download it just so you can be in there asking for prayer requests about your Aunt Nelly in Chicago. That's not what the app is for. No, we do have the wherewithal to do that. We have a prayer number. I just don't want to mix things up between the two worlds. I want to focus on entrepreneurs, young or old, black or white or brown. If you're an entrepreneur and you really need, you need somebody to help you rethink in this hour how to go forward. Uh, good soil movement is our beauty. Bishop, we can't say thank you enough, but we're going to say thank you. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule, for coming by the show and dropping all this wisdom on us. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for the show. And I hope I've been able to help somebody. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Another fantastic edition of the His and Her Money Show is complete. Do yourself a favor. Look in the show notes of this episode. You'll find a link to everything that Bishop T.D. Jakes mentioned during this interview. It's time for you to have some disruptive thinking and become who God sent you to this earth to become because you have work to do. That's all we got for this time, guys. It's been great. Until next time. Peace.